And you never knew that, did you? No, I didn't. But he is an absolute authority. Uh, this guy, as you can tell, probably could have retired a few years ago and ju done just fine. But he's continuing to engage in building workforce priced uh, rental at a time that he doesn't need to in his career because he really believes that that end of the housing spectrum needs to be served. And we're going to define that end and we'll find that it's much closer to the middle than I think a lot of people realize. Cheryl Jacobson comes to us from Dakota County where she's had an, a distinguished career in housing and brings a tremendous amount of expertise to our community. About a year and a half now, Cheryl? She's director of our HRA, and as you know, our county board sought last year to levy a uh, HRA levy in our property tax for the first time in the history of our county. They could have gone two and a half percent. They went about half of that, and Cheryl is charged with taking that revenue and putting it to good use in the creation of, of housing. Of, of all different levels, and she really brings a, a wealth of experience to that. Jeff Ellerbush has been with us, uh, Rochester Olmsted Consolidated Planning. I don't, I'm not even going to guess how many years, Jeff, but he started when he was 10. He was a child prodigy, no, no I'm sorry, but he is, uh, he's one of the guys I call when I'm looking for data. As a beginner, hey Jeff, what are you, and he directs me to the right website, and uh, so what I'm going to be presenting you as a part of my presentation tonight, some of the data comes from Jeff, but he has just a tremendous body of experience in all facets of planning. Jeff Urban is, is kind of maybe, the, sorry for saying this, Jeff, but kind of the wild card at this table, because, and I asked uh, Ann specifically if we could have him up here, what he is doing in the county is so important right now. Uh, we have a mobile home car, court uh, out on Marion Road, that started with all the best of intentions. And the idea was in the mid 70s that if you buried the mobile home so it wasn't sitting up on blocks and didn't have to have skirting and a great big high entry that it would look more like a regular home and it would be more attractive to folks. And I know that because I started in a mobile home in about the mid 70s and I looked at the mobile homes in that park. I just chose another one for other reasons and I thought they were cool too because they were dug down and the threshold came right out at ground level. Guess what? With no ventilation down there, they've rotted. And a lot of those mid-70s mobile homes are still in use. And they're in use by people that can't afford other forms of housing. So if you think the land of the Mayo Clinic doesn't have something that resembles a slum, and I don't say this in a, in a disparaging way, but it is an area where the housing has been allowed to deteriorate beyond anything we would like to think exists in our community. And this man single-handedly as the minister at Bear Creek Church, the outreach minister, has made it his project to get donated materials from Home Depot and other places and donated labor from contractors that are active in their churches with this network of churches he's put together. And he is out there single-handedly putting new envelopes around some of these old trailers and new windows and new heating plants out of donated equipment. And it is a real undertaking because trying to bring those trailers up to code is pretty darn difficult. And I asked him, I asked if he could be at this table so he could present the real unique end of this issue in our community that does exist in our community. And then of course, the last but certainly not least, Pete Geeson, he's been with public health for years and years. Uh, again, he started when he was 10. Um, he's been the director now for eight years? Five. Five, I knew it, five years. And uh, he will bring a wealth of information about the impacts of housing on the collective health of our community. Uh, not just, uh, well, the mental health, the stress level. Uh, when you hear things like up to 50% of the renters in the county are paying up to 50% of their gross monthly income on their housing, that causes stressors. When kids have to shift from school to school to school because mom or dad, single mom or dad, is being moved out of their apartment because they suddenly can't afford it anymore or because a variety of other reasons, what does that do to that child's educational experience? That child that's just 10 years old now in the fourth grade, but in just 13 years from now, which I used to think was a long time, but I don't think it's a long time anymore, just 13 years from now, we want that child to be a productive member of our workforce, paying taxes and contributing to the community. And is it in our best interest for that child to go home to squalor or to be shifted from apartment to school to school to school on an annual basis because mom or dad can't afford a place to live? So that's the perspective uh, that Pete will bring, and I hope I didn't just tell too much of his story because he can tell it in a lot more detail. So where am I going to start? Well, first of all, I'm going to put this in my pocket so I'm not standing here holding it the whole time. And I'm going to try to figure out this thing.
Whoop, what am I pointing it at? Pointing at this? Okay. So I'm going to apologize in advance about this particular slideshow because I kind of do it a little differently. But the slideshow that I put together is kind of data driven and has charts and graphs and it looks like a 63 year old guy that used to be the sheriff would probably dream up. And this was something that was written by a marketing communications person that we've hired. So this is much cooler, but it doesn't necessarily follow my format. So I'll kind of stumble through it and I'll apologize in advance. This is our community. You all know what it looks like. It is a fabulous place to live. And with what's going on right now in the development of our community, we have wonderful problems to have to worry about in our community. But there is another side to what's going on here, and that's the folks that are having trouble finding a place to live because the cost of housing is escalating much more quickly than compensation for the jobs they do. Who, are, who am I talking about? Well, here's a continuum for you. And let me see if I can find this thing. Look at that. All the way from one end of the spectrum at homeless up to the higher end of the spectrum at, we will say, market rate and everything in between. There's half of area median income. Area median income by census data. So if any of you are involved in housing and you know the housing and urban development, the federal HUD numbers, they won't show that as being the median. They base their numbers on a different set of criteria. I've gone with this because, frankly, the story is a little bit easier to tell. So at 67,000, 2010 to 2014, uh, U.S. Census figures for Olmstead County, the area median income. 80% of that, 53.6, is generally where services begin to be able to help people that are looking for housing. Again, if there's children in the household, those numbers might be a little different by HUD standards. But again, to, to eliminate confusion and in getting into the more complex HUD system, I'm going with this. At half of AMI or less, we tend to have services for people. Uh, Cheryl can get into a little more detail about what kind of services we have to support people at the point of below uh, a half of median annual household gross income. And of course, on the far end, we have the homeless. What I have been focusing on for Rochester Foundation since I took this job at the beginning of the year is this gap right in here that I'm calling the workforce housing gap. And why that? Because I'm guessing, unless any of you have been in the housing market in the last year, you probably don't know that you can have up to 55,000 of annual gross household income and have trouble finding a place to live in our community. That's fact, but most folks that haven't been in the market wouldn't believe that. So that's why we focus on it this way. Psst. Affordability is relationship between income and increased costs. What has gone up so dramatically in recent years? Basically, in just re very recent years, the cost of land has really driven it, but the cost of a two by four, the cost of labor, the expense inputs into creating a unit of housing, whether it's rental or for sale home ownership, has gone up, again, faster than incomes. Here's Olmstead County in 2011, and these numbers come to us care of Southeastern Minnesota Association of Realtors, Jim Miner who's right, sitting right up here. He assembles these no numbers on a monthly basis. He, mail he emails them out to all of us interested folks. And whenever I call Jim and say, can you give me an update on what's, uh, what's current today within hours, he gives me a turnaround. So, sir, he is my numbers guru. 2011, year to date, September data, the average sold price in Olmsted County is 181,000. 2015, last year, 214,000. This year, year to date, average sold price, 232,000. Now the median is up from, up 44,000 since 2011. The sold price, the average is up 51,000. So you see, there's not a lot of difference. I mean, you could say that the averages were up if in fact one piece of the market was up and another wasn't, but the, the median and the average are pretty consistent there. That's what's happening to housing prices in the county, or in the Olmsted County. Who are we talking about? Who does this affect? These are the kinds of jobs we're talking about. Very often, when I say affordable housing, what are the first words that come to people's mind? Say something. Don't be ashamed. Low income. Right? Low income. 
What do you think about when you think of low income? Crime, addiction, joblessness, or starter jobs, low skill jobs, jobs that nobody should plan on staying in the rest of their life. They should, that's a high school job. If you're trying to make a career out of that, you shouldn't make any money, right? You've heard those arguments, right? We're talking about people that make up to 55,000 a year or that 80% number I told you. 80% of AMI, 53.6. If that's one single wage earner in that household, that's a job that pays $25.77 an hour for a normal 40 hour week, one full time equivalent job, 25.77. How many jobs in this county make less than 25.77 an hour? Here's some examples. Police officer up to four or five years, deputy sheriff, state trooper. Teacher, social worker, medical tax, administrative assistants, welders, the trades. I've checked with all the unions, plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. Up to five, six years that it does the, the time that it takes to get the requisite hours necessary to move through apprentice and get up to uh, the, the professional level. Anywhere from four to six years, depending on how busy they can stay. During that period of time, they will go from 50% of AMI all the way to 80% of AMI. And when they make it all the way to the top, they'll be all the way at area median income. And at area median income, you can participate in this market without assistance, no question about it. But these are the kinds of jobs we're talking about. When that young person comes home from Afghanistan after serving in the middle at military at 24 years of age and goes to work for the uh, electrician, as an electrician for the electrician's union, he or she can count on being below 80% of AMI up until the time they're 30 or 31 years old. And if they have a child or two during that period of time or if they suddenly find themselves single, that's where complicating factors come in. It's not about starter jobs. It's not about low income. It's not about those people that won't work. Here's some models, uh, some model budgets. This is on 53.6. On 53.6, you average over $4,400. Um, I mean, you you gross over $4,400 a month gross income. On that number, somebody will give you a mortgage up to 30% of your monthly gross per side, provided your your monthly total indebtedness obligation doesn't exceed 44, 43, 45%. So you can get a mortgage, assuming. 4% for, uh, 4 for 30 years, and assuming $300 for taxes and insurance, you can get a mortgage enough to buy you a house of about $217,000. I know there's a lot of assumings there. I hate to uh, put you to sleep with data, but that's what it looks like you can afford. But here's your budget. 27.2% withholding for medical state, uh, excuse me, federal, state, FICA, and Medicare. So now you're netting $3,250 on that full-time job that grosses 53.6. Here's a real skinny budget. That's based on uh, county employment, vehicles and maintenance. That's assuming that somebody needs a 100,000 mile car that's five years old that costs $10,000 that mom or dad is not available to give to them so they had to finance it for 30 months at 6% interest. So that's the kind of work I put into this budget modeling. The other expenses you can see there, that's what's left at the end of your month on 53.6 of annual income. That's what's left at the end of your month for your housing. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? Well, what can you get for that? Oh, by the way, this budget does not include savings, college loan payments, life insurance, credit card payments, contingency funds, home maintenance, and I might add Christmas fund, vacation fund, birthday funds, dance, gymnastics, camp, none of that. That's bare bones. 2,400 bucks a month is a skinny budget for one parent and one school-aged child. A lot of people have trouble believing that. So what can you get on 850? Well, I told you they would give you a mortgage for 217, 217,000 based on the gross, but based on what you really have to spend at the end of that month, you can get a mortgage for 136,000. Eh, maybe not too bad. Or you have that 850 to spend on an apartment. And if that's all you have, maybe you shouldn't own that house because we all know that it costs more to own the house than just the average monthly payment. You gotta mow the lawn and you gotta replace the, the roof and what have you. You amortize that all out. It's, it's way more than just the, the principal interest taxes and insurance cost. So maybe you shouldn't have a house in the first place. 
Maybe you should just be renting an apartment so if the refrigerator goes upside down, somebody wheels in a new one, right? Control your downside risk. So what can you get for that kind of money? Well, last week, according to Mr. Miner here, there was 29 homes on the market between 75K and 140K. And I've been looking at those homes and I can tell you that if that's all you can afford, you got some issues because they all have some issues. If you can find something for 120, it's either about the size of a, a car and a half garage, or it's got you got to replace the furnace or the roof or the windows or something within the first couple of years of owning it. 29 of them for a population of what's the county? 150, Jeff. The real estate people tell me that we should have an active inventory for a county our size of about 900 homes. On the day I captured that from Jim, we had about 275 on the market. That's a tight market. That means there's not much opportunity out there. So what do you have for apartments? Well, you shouldn't be rent uh, buying anyway. Oh, we have seven of them available as of the 15th. Where did I get that number? I called Paramark, Matic, Jacobson, IRET, called them all personally did a personal interview. Now, I also went to Craigslist. Craigslist isn't really easy to be dependable because a lot of people leave their ad up even after the apartment's gone. So it's hard to get a good ask, a good look there. But even including Craigslist, that number zoomed all the way to about 30. Excluding Craigslist, it's about seven that were available on that day. Two bedroom apartments at a thousand bucks a month or less. What did our Single parent family with one school aged child have available there? 850. Whoop, wrong way. There we go. How many people make that kind of money? Not a big deal, is it? Under $50,000 under $50, by the U.S. Census 2010 to 2014, 36.5% of the households in the county are $50,000 or under. 12.5% are between 35 and 50. So about half of AMI, up to about 75% of AMI. So anywhere you go in the community, Thursdays on first, Riverside concerts, anywhere you think that there is an equal distribution of income across the population. Not when you're going out to dinner at the country club or summer bee, but when you're going to concerts, free concerts in the park or at Mail Park, look across that crowd. One third of them fit this number in our community. Many apartments are being built. Mr. Jim's numbers will tell you that right now it's 4,150, something like that, that are just being approved, and maybe more now with the Aladdis project being approved last night. How much? 44. 44. 4,400 approved coming out of the ground or brand new just being leased within the last few months. 4,400. Sounds like an apartment building boom. Some people say it's going to depress prices because we're overbuilding, so we're going to have too much demand, so price will go down. Well, the guy was here from the Fed here a couple of months ago back in May. What was his name? Kashari? His staff said he thought we could survive three years of that kind of building, apartment building boom because we're lagging way behind uh, Fargo and Sioux Falls the way it is. I don't know what the actual truth is. But Jim's numbers will tell you that those 4,400 and some apartments, except the ones being built by Mr. Weiss, are starting at about $1,200 a month for a two-bedroom apartment, and many of them are higher than that from thirteen dollars to $1,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. Joe represents the only ones in the community right now with, a, with few exceptions. There's a few in the new, they're not going to call it Buckeye anymore, they're going to call it something else down in 3rd and 4th Southeast. Flats on what are they calling it? Flats on 4th. Yeah, I knew that. And um, um, the park on Kutsky has 18 units in it. Every other unit that's new that fits the description that we'd call workforce, a thousand bucks a month, roughly, or less for a two-bedroom apartment, this gentleman right here. And fewer than 130 of them out of that 4,400 4, fit that category. Is that bad? No. Some very accomplished real estate experts in this audience will tell you that you need to have a robust inventory at every level. That if you don't have a robust inventory at the market level, no one's ever going to be interested in building at the lower level. So it's not that we should malign all those folks building at that level. It's important in our community. It just points out that for that 36% that are 50,000 or less, it's going to have trouble finding a place to live because only seven of them were available. 
DMC will demand even more growth. I'm not a statistician, and I'm not a Jeff Eller Bush. But if DMC is going to bring in 20,000 more jobs, and they've said anywhere from 20 to 35,000 over the next 20 years, and if each one of those jobs is attached to 2.3 people, is it fair to us, and not all those people are going to work for Mayo making 150000 a year, if the income distribution in our community is such that 36% are under 50000 household gross annual income right now, is it reasonable to assume that of the 40, 50, 60000 coming in, the household dist income distribution will be similar? Because while there might be some people making 150, there's going to be plenty of mechanics and teachers and cops that have to increase to meet that increased demand? Is that a fair assumption? That the income distribution will be fair? Well, our market right now that serves those people is absolutely saturated. There is no room for new ones to come into town. So DMC, while it represents all kinds of opportunity, it doesn't represent relief from this market crunch at people making less than 50000 a year. So what are we doing? Well, Rats Dairy Foundation and the person to me is beginning to lead and convene, kind of be a lead collaborator for, at some point, doing some fundraising that will create a local fund to supplement state and federal dollars so that we can buy down the cost of producing new housing to this market level. Yes, it's a subsidy, but I can't think of a, a quicker way out of it right now. There's a lot, we subsidize lots of things. I'm not the authority. The people that know this stuff tell me that we got to bring more money to bear. We're not quite ready for it at this, in the community just yet. The, the opinion makers and the decision makers aren't totally convinced that the situation is sufficiently urgent to justify market intervention through subsidies at this point. But you can expect within the next 12 months to be hearing about a fundraising initiative in the community as we did in 2000 with the first homes program when Mayo kicked in four million then eventually another seven million and we raised in the community 14 and a half million between 2000 and 2008 and created or facilitated the creation of 1100 housing units the study that we had done by the Maxfield Research Co Corporation between 2013 and 2014 said that by 2020 we needed to build 170 workforce price under 200,000 new houses for sale per year between 2015 and 2020. People who build houses can't, they'll tell you they can't build one for under 200,000 because the prices have escalated. It also said we needed to build 240, I think it was 242, workforce priced apartments per year between 2015 and 2020. This man's doing the majority of what's being done right now and he's maybe getting to 110 a year. So we're lagging behind. That's what the challenge is. That's why we're here talking about this, because the more of you that understand it, the more, the more that you can help be a, a solution to what's happening in our community. I'm not going to read that one. You can spread the news. What are we doing? Well, one of the things we can do is government advocacy. Relief from certain fees for a certain thin sliver of housing. I'm not going to advocate for anything right here, right now, but there are some fees that we charge in our community that maybe we could take another look at. Is it really all that necessary? Here's a nifty little number that comes at me, oops, sorry, from uh, Rats Dairy Building Association. For every $1,000 increase in the cost of creating a house, 139 households are excluded from being able to participate in the market. Joe will tell you that for the senior facility that he wants to build on at the Bamber Ridge, no, excuse me, not Bamber Ridge, Badger Ridge, west of town, how many units? 138 units. That the plant investment fee and the parkland dedication fee together, just those two fees, is going to cost a half million dollars. Did you say that was senior housing? That's senior housing. That's senior housing. Senior workforce price. Hmm? So it's not for working people. Yeah, well, it's for seniors that aren't working, but their income is at what we call a workforce level, under 50000 a year. But they're not, but they're not working. They have a job every day. Right. Well, maybe they are, but they're still seniors. So a lot of seniors are working. I hope to, if somebody will give me a job. 
the, uh, what else can we do? Some of the things that we're working on below market rate financing tools. We have gap loans. We have a community land trust. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds on this. These guys can talk more deeply about this. I just wanted to set the stage with this presentation. We have the opportunity right now in our community to decide what kind of community we want to have. One of the answers that you'll get from some people when you talk about this is that we can't build our way out of this and we shouldn't be subsidizing. Let the market do what the market's going to do. And if people need to drive down the road to Claremont where they can get cheaper land, they need to drive down the road. Hey, people are going to do what they, you know, they do what they have to do, right? Well, is that the kind of community we want? Do we want to look at our entire service sector? And by service sector, I mean those good jobs and say, sorry, we don't have any room for you to live in our community. You can work here. You can serve us here. You can give me, Mr. Barista, my cup of coffee, my latte every morning. But no, I'm sorry, you can't work. You can't live here because we're not going to invest in the kind of housing that you can afford. Is that what we want? This is our opportunity as a community to make that decision. I know what I want, but not everybody is together on that quite yet. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks. That's the affordability gap all the way up into the mid-50s. There are lots of other gaps that need to be filled in this business, and these folks are some experts at it. Any questions for me? How'd I do? All right. So, Mr. Weiss, sir, yes. please describe your role as it pertains to affordable housing. Now, what's your perspective on what needs, to, what we are doing, and what needs to be done, and what more we can do? I'll repeat some of those. If you could just start, describe <laughs> your role, and, and what you know about the topic. Well, we uh, been kind of pioneers in affordable housing. We did the uh, first uh, low-income housing project in Rochester back in 1971. 104 units. Uh, that program, uh, that was one where you pay 30 percent of your income for rent. And that program isn't really around anymore except through the HRA uh, if you can get a voucher, uh, which kind of does the same thing. Uh, we've gone on and uh, built Oh, I don't know, probably eight or nine hundred units over the last uh, 40 years of uh, various types of affordable housing. And unfortunately, most of the programs uh, require uh, either federal, state, or local, or all three subsidy from the from the government. It's painful for me. Uh, conservative Republican to confess to that, but uh, <laughs> that's the uh, that's the truth. It, 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 it's impossible to create affordable housing without that kind of uh, uh, assistance from the uh, government, and uh, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, is that enough for now? So enough for now, I would just add to, to the, what Joe says, what, one of the things I've learned, and maybe, maybe I benefit from bringing a fresh set of eyes and some of the questions I can ask. What is it about the cost of creating an, a unit of housing that's driving the cost so much? And one of the key inputs that's costing so much is the cost of money. You can control the cost of land a little bit. Uh, you can't really control the, the cost of a two by four. The cost of labor is continuing to go up. Developers that aren't all rolling in the dough, and they can't all shrink their margin to nothing, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be in the business. And I think the recession took uh, the, the folks that were rolling in the dough out of it. The people that are smart are still around after the recession. So what do you have to do? You have to control the cost of money. And so if you go out, you want to build 100 units, you go out and get all the commercial uh, money you can for commercial rates from the banks. But they can only go so low, and if you do nothing but that, you're going to have to charge $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 a month. If you want to build something down to 1000 bucks, you've got to get some cheaper money. So it's typical to have some mezzanine financing from an outfit like Greater Minnesota Housing Fund that would loan you money at less than market rates. And then some cases on top of that, 
You need some free money piled on. It looks like a loan. It's called a loan. There's no interest, no payments for 30 years. But that's what's required to buy down the cost of financing enough that you can charge those kinds of rates. So that's kind of how the money gets brought to the market. Now, do carpenters and electricians and developers all make some money along the way? Yeah, you got to, or else no one's going to build it. But is anybody walking away with a great big pile of money? I don't think so. The margins are pretty thin in that business right now. Cheryl Jacobson, please describe your role as it pertains to affordable housing. From your perspective, what are issues associated with affordable housing? And I'll only do two, but you're younger, so I only gave you two. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Cheryl Jacobs, and I'm the Executive Director of the Olmstead County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. And the HRA, as you may have heard it um, spoken to, has been around since about 1994, actually. Um, we are an affordable housing provider here. We service um, all of Olmstead County, not just Rochester. Um, we have about 200 units um, in Rochester, however, that um, we are owning and managing as far as affordable rentals go. And as Joe had mentioned earlier, uh, we administer um, the Federal Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is um, the primary rental assistance program that exists in Olmstead County. And so our Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, applicants to that program, um, once they come to the top of the waiting list, which by the way, our waiting list has been closed since 2012, it's a highly demanded program. Um, residents uh, receive a voucher and they pay 30% of their monthly income towards their rent and they are renting units in the private rental market. So they are accessing some of those units that may be coming online if that owner landlord chooses to participate in our program. Um, some of the issues I ended up kind of listing out a long list of issues associated with affordable housing and so I'll, I'll pare some of that down um, because they have really been spoken about already. Um, market conditions um, obviously are a huge impact um, to the creation and um, continued sustainability of affordable housing. Um, wages, as were mentioned, I think the post-housing bust um, has left a lot of households in the situation of needing to rent or wanting to rent more than pursuing home ownership. I think the millennials um, that are maybe uh, in the position of uh, going out on their own and having a, um, a home ownership opportunity are maybe not as interested um, in their mid-20s as, as uh, groups may have been previously just given what they've seen their parents go through with the foreclosure crisis. Um, I also think other issues associated with affordable housing uh, could be defined as location, location, location. The development of affordable housing uh, in Olmstead County is much different in our smaller communities than it is in Rochester. It's a whole different um, financing game, I think, in smaller communities size-wise um, and what can be developed. So I think location um, is a key. Also location of available and suitable land. Um, if you don't have land or sites that work to build affordable housing developments, um, it adds to the cost um, and it makes it a little bit harder. Um, Steve mentioned and Joe mentioned a little bit about the financing. Um, financing affordable housing units can be a bit of a struggle. Um, a lot of times in deals we can see five, six, seven, sometimes 15 different sources of funding to make an affordable housing development happen. And that, um, that, is, that is a tricky part of it. Um, also competition for the resources that create affordable housing. Um, a big resource for uh, developers in our area is the state of Minnesota, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, we compete with other greater Minnesota communities for those funds. And so competition for those resources I also see as an issue uh, in the creation and preservation of affordable housing. Um, from a, a more personal perspective in the um, running of my agency, the HRA, we have federal housing programs and over the course of uh, the last couple decades, the federal government has really disinvested in affordable housing. Our Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, the federal government is not adding any more vouchers. We don't get um, additional dollars. We have a hard time um, administering those vouchers because we don't get fully funded for those. 
the federal government is not funding additional units of public housing, which add to um, the affordable housing portfolio for a housing and redevelopment authority. So I think that um, is an issue as well. And I'll stop right there. Okay. Um, we'll come back to you because there's a few more things I'd like to, to know before you're done. Uh, Jeff, I know that a lot's been said about housing and your expertise isn't just in housing. It's throughout all facets of planning. One of the things I haven't talked about so far is how closely transportation and housing are linked. Because if in fact you do need to commute to Cass Center, Dodge Center, or Claremont to find an affordable place, what role does transportation play in the whole housing expense piece? And can you comment at all about transportation and housing relative to the new comprehensive plan that's being rewritten right now? Thanks. Yep. I'm Jeff Ellerbush. I've worked here in Rochester since 1977. So I've seen a lot of stuff uh, new and the stuff I've seen new is now old. And uh, it reminds you of your uh, time on this planet. Um, yeah, as uh, Steve mentioned, um, the combination of land use and transportation is the, is the main issue in our update to our comprehensive plan. It's the two things that, that the government is most closely involved in. Um, there's not a lot of private transportation provision. People don't want to own the roads or own the bus system because for the most part they don't make money. So the government is, uh, has an involvement in that. And as pointed out in some of the information that was uh, displayed earlier, transportation is on the average about the second mo biggest part of a regular budget for a family. Uh, housing being first and transportation being second. So if the cost of transportation can be made um, less to a family, they can afford more for their housing portion of the budget ha that has to go towards housing. So in the uh, land use planning effort, um, we're attempting to be more compact in our growth pattern, less roads, because every road that you build becomes a road forever, and the government owns it forever, and the government maintains it forever. So uh, building less roads um, it saves us money to spend on other things. But that's another issue we're way behind on the cost of maintaining roads. So that's another, another headache we're going to have to address. But why perpetuate it? Uh, we're looking for a compact uh, growth pattern, uh, more density, and especially a better um, bus transit system that provides uh, more quality service in times of um, length of service, early in the morning to later at night. Our bus system right now provides a uh, good bus service to people working downtown. And it's because we have a very unique situation in Rochester that's not found in almost any other city in the United States that has over 40 some thousand jobs in one location in a downtown in a city that has 112,000 people. It's not, it's not normal. Uh, that's abnormal in any, any, any situation. Uh, so getting the people down to work in, a, in uh, downtown Rochester is a goal to maintain the quality of life and the, and the economic sustainability of the community is to keep the downtown healthy. To keep the downtown healthy, we can't choke the downtown off with uh, cars and parking. And that's the two things that we can help reduce the demand for by having a better transit system. So the transit system does not necessarily um, provide just service to people of, of lower means. It provides service to people with really good jobs. Uh, who also work downtown, but if they, that transit system is there to provide service to them, it's a big, big sec segment of the community, it gets more community support than uh, maybe just asking to raise money for affordable housing. Uh, subsidizing the cost of transit uh, to the general population can be another way that you're looking at really subsidizing the cost of housing. Because if you can decrease the, 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 the cost of, of the uh, money spent on housing, or excuse me, on transportation, it can help. So our planning efforts going to uh, be focused around that. We think we can grow our community of about 23,000 new housing units. That's the, that's the growth projection that we have between now and um, 2040. That's for Rochester, not Olmstead County. That's the city of Rochester. It's 50,000 people and about 50,000 jobs. So those 50,000 people fit in 23,000 housing units because there's 2.3 
something, people browsing unit. Uh, the jobs is another thing. All the jobs can't be, we have a problem providing all the people to work in all the jobs. So we have commuters that come to Rochester on a daily basis. Commuting is going to have to uh, increase dramatically to, to meet those job growth horizons, as well as the growth of our community with new workers. And the job growth problem is a problem that every uh, community across the United States is having a problem with. Um, not enough workers for all the jobs that we have. And so making an attractive place for downtown with good transit service uh, attracts workers too. So that's an, another thing that we're trying to do with the, the planning effort. It requires um, a lot of cooperation. It's going to require uh, different sources of funding and different ways we spend our money. Uh, but uh, uh, we hope that we can uh, right the ship a little bit toward a sunnier future in, uh, by 2040. But uh, the, the cost of money is a question. Money at all at any local budget is, is the problem. You read the newspaper tonight about how the city council is struggling with the budget that they're working with now. Um, there's not a lot of extra money around um, to throw at things. They're talking between 8 and 10% increase in property taxes. Right now, the city of Rochester, on the affordable housing issue, just to get the plug in, they do do some, some things. About a million dollars a year in what's called tax increment financing has been uh, provided to the uh, construction of affordable housing over the last 15 years. Tax increment financing is kind of a, a deal where you, uh, you get the taxes that are generated off the new development, and the taxes that are generated pay back a loan that you give the development to happen in the first place. So it's more or less, it doesn't cost the budget anything, but it doesn't raise our tax base until that money's paid back. So it's, a, it's an easy way to finance without raising the local property taxes. If you do it too much, you cut your tax base down and then you start from a smaller, smaller, smaller uh, calculation, you get less taxes. But that's the situation. Uh, Jeff, thank you. And thank you for uh, mentioning what the city of Rochester has done with, I get a little passionate when I talk about the challenge going forward. That isn't to suggest that our local governments haven't uh, address this issue in the past and, and put resources into it. They have indeed, and Jeff rightly points that out, and I'm glad he did. They also, in addition to tax increment financing, uh, each year they have put a good portion of their community development block grant into rehabilitation programs, and that's another topic I haven't touched on here. We need to make sure that our neighborhoods, uh, particularly our lower income neighborhoods, don't fall off the inventory by falling into disrepair and not being an attractive place to purchase a house anymore because we can't just go out and build a bunch of new ones while a bunch of old ones fall into disuse. And so we have rehab programs for owners that are of limited means, that are income qualified, and they can get a, a Minnesota fix-up loan or the program that's administered by Rob Mathias that's funded by the Community Development Block Grant money through the city that funds uh, loans for fixing up key aspects, essential core systems of a house. And so those programs are in existence. They aren't adequate. There are waiting lists for them. And we don't have any that are targeted right at a buyer yet. You have to be in the home. They're owner-occupied. But those programs do exist, and the city has made considerable uh, contributions to those programs. So I just wanted to make sure that that didn't go uh, unforgotten or forgotten. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to pay for their housing. Uh, also, 
people have told me about uh, friends of theirs have made uh, places become available, but they're uh, filled with people coming in from other states, and they're again, not working people, they're retired people, but they have no difficulty getting housing. And uh, I don't know, it's about a year ago, well, About a year ago, I used to ride the bus, a particular bus that I always ride. There was a woman on it from England. She had a very thick Liverpool accent. And she said when she retired, she wanted to go to a warm climate, so she came over here and went to California, but she couldn't get housing. So she ended up downtown in Rochester, and she told me she had two enormous rooms, very large rooms. $200 a month. Well, that's a deal. Why can't these people that work down here live in those apartments? Why do we have to bring in people from England and various other states? Why can't we put working people in Manchester in those apartments? Okay, fair questions. Let me try to pick them off one at a time. The first one was transportation. No. And I think you were referencing the difficulty in finding after hours transportation, public transportation. Jeff, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, it is a, pro it is a problem uh, and always has been. It's because it's very expensive to run. It's a demand that's needed, but the buses won't be full. A bus that runs with two or three people in it is a very expensive ride. And that's why it, it, it requires a, a much higher subsidy. The city is doing a five-year, they do a five-year update plan for their transit service and they're just completing it right now. And they're going to attempt to increase um, that type of service over the next five years in the form of, of uh, later night runs on selected routes, the ones that make the most sense. Uh, they won't do it everywhere across town. Every bus route's not going to run later, but they're going to choose about five of them and try, to try and run them later. But again, that, that costs more money. So even instituting that change requires that it's not going to be done in the 2017 budget because the 2017 budget's already stretched. So next, next time in the 2018 budget, they're going to ask for more money to help with that. You've got to hire more bus drivers you gotta, you, and to run it and stuff like that. So they're going to do it. That, uh, I understand it does work, but um, at 4 Hill, which is the uh, around the apartment on the west side, very nice housing units, uh, discovered that most of the people work in the same place. So instead of having all these cars come out of their garages, Now, that's private, but it's, uh, they solve the problem. Let me address that just a little bit. Jeff's absolutely right. From a public perspective, it's tough to do. And it's even a more difficult issue for people that are mobility challenged and use some kind of appliance to get around because they can't get transportation after 8 o'clock or sometimes 7 o'clock at night. So they're like captive in their house after 7 o'clock at night and can't even attend public hearings and things like this because they can't get that bus ride home. And cab fare can be prohibitive for people in that level. So these are definitely issues. Now, one of the things that's just emerging, and I just had a conversation with uh, Joe Jacobson from Rochester City Lines, the company that used to have the public service for the bus service, they are actually making private deals with some uh, market rate apartment houses that want to offer transportation as one of the amenities for the rent in their, so maybe we'll see those kinds of things, but there are numerous unresolved transportation issues, none the least of which is if you are residing in Dodge Center, because that's where you can find an affordable place, and you are riding the bus in to go to work at Mayo, and your kid gets sick at 11.30 in, in the day, how do you get back home to get them home from school? Or your child has to go to the orthodontist, or, 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 in the middle of the day. Or they close school because of a, a blizzard. Now you've got to get home from Mayo in the middle of the day, and guess what? The bus runs in the morning, and it runs again in the evening. So we have a number of challenges in that regard, and I appreciate that you brought it up. Now your other point, I'm going to give to Cheryl quick, but I'll give you a warning. Um, I will tell you that in my 30 plus years in, pub, in law enforcement, uh, 18 of which being your sheriff, whenever you have a public program that grants aid to people at the lower end of the income food chain, you're going to have some examples of some that maybe aren't quite as deserving, 
but manage to get some aid. It's inevitable. One of the questions you have to answer as a community is do you want to deny everybody to prevent the few from gaming the system? I don't know. I know that Cheryl has many processes in place to try to minimize the gaming of the system. But I, my experience is it always tends to look worse than what it really is. Cheryl, your, your turn. Thank you. That's a really good question. So I had mentioned um, one of our largest programs is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which provides a voucher or assistance for somebody to rent in the private rental market. The transplant or the person coming in using a voucher, they can bring that with them from a different jurisdiction. So they can move from California. If they have a voucher, a housing choice voucher from California, they can bring that with them and use that in Olmstead County. It's called portability. And it is completely allowed by the federal government. So that could answer your question about um, the New York person. With Park Towers, they also have a program that's called Section 8. However, their program is called Project-Based Section 8, and they have that ability to offer that program as an owner because of the financing they received when they originally um, purchased or built that development. And so someone who would like to live there actually applies to that owner or to that property manager company for that unit, and so that assistance sticks with that unit. That's different from um, the voucher that we talked about that New York person bringing to us. And so it really depends on the um, application or eligibility requirements um, that go along with that financing, which is also called Section 8. So it gets a little bit confusing because there's really two Section 8 programs. One is a financing program for a developer owner, which comes with certain affordability requirements for a length of time. It's very similar to the voucher program that my agency administers, um, but just slightly different at the same time. Well, I, I can, the best I can tell you right now for the purpose of this conversation is they have numerous programs in place to try to eliminate people from gaming the system. There are going to be some that get by that, but the bulk of our issue is what we've defined here is the growth. And yes, we need to do everything we can to restrict people from misusing the system, but it's not prevalent. The processes they have in place keep it to a minimum. I do need to keep moving here. We have too many, pe two more people left to, to speak, and we're, we're down to our last half an hour. So uh, please hang on to any other questions in that regard. And certainly, I'd be happy to talk about them afterwards. I don't mean to shut you off. But I do need to keep moving along with our additional uh, panelists here. Jeff Urban, I gave you a pretty good in introduction as to what he does. Uh, Jeff, I'd like you just to elaborate on what you do and what you find at that end of the housing market in our community. Sure. So yeah, I am a minister. I went to seminary, and now I fix mobile homes a lot, uh, most of the week. I probably spend 80% of my time. Uh, my, the church has allowed me to do that. I'm an associate pastor. Uh, about seven years ago, we were just going through town looking for what the biggest needs were. We drove through Oak Terrace Parkside mobile home parks right across from the armory on Marion Road. And if you've been through there, or you were there a number of years ago, you, you know, you, if it was your first time, you thought, wow. I had no idea um, the dilapidated houses and um, all the issues that were there. And so that kind of struck a chord with us, and we started helping a family out. And the first family, we came in, we raised $5,000. You walk into their house, they had sheetrock they put up. They bought the house for $500, and uh, they're very thrifty. They had a sink in the middle of the room. That's all they had. Um, and so... We raised this money, we built, we built the kitchen and put the flooring in and do this work in the house. And then we realized about six, I mean, it was great. Uh, about six months later, they had a new car out front, or a pretty shiny car. And then six months later, another shiny car out front. 
we thought, you know, we got to change our model a little bit. And so we looked at Habitat for Humanity and we kind of follow their model now where we have people pay for the costs that are incurred as much as they're able and we make them stretch. Um, but we find if they have skin in the game, if they not only have skin in the game that they're, you know, accountable, but they also, it, it builds their capacity that they can actually solve their own problems. And so sometimes we're just working with Home Depot and places, uh, donations that we get to get uh, material to families to work on their houses uh, to fix them up themselves. Other times we're going in and we're helping build ramps, put roofs on houses. The biggest problem, as Steve alluded to, uh, moisture issues. So he, he talked about the houses that are buried. Um, there's also lots of houses, and we work all throughout Olmsted County, um, have leaky roofs. They haven't been leaking for a month. They haven't been leaking for a year. They've been leaking for a long, long time. And if it's a flat, kind of little rounded flat roof, uh, it's just a matter of time and that water comes in, a tree hits the top, there's a dent in it. People put tar and different kind of goopy things on top and our freeze-thaw cycle just kind of gets rid of that in a couple years and they start all over again. And then they have this cake on top of their trailer that doesn't keep anything out, catches water probably. So we, we try to start with uh, the roof, the windows, the siding, kind of wrap, kind of weatherize this thing so the water stays out. Working with folks that are low income, probably the lowest end of Steve's spectrum up there. A lot of them are in the service industry. They're working at Seneca. They're cleaning hotels for us. They're cooking your burger. Um, and they're doing it happily. Uh, they're happy to do it. A lot of them are working two jobs. Um, a lot of them have families. And so the, the issue for them is income. They just don't make enough money. They could never pay eight fifty dollars a month. So they buy a trailer for $3,000, they get their friends together, they put another three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 into it, they've got five to $10,000 into this house, and they make it work. And they keep fixing it, and they keep remodeling it. Um, one of the challenges that people also have is the legal status. So people don't have papers, they, they're not able to uh, have any kind of assistance, maybe for their kids, if their kids were born here, but they don't have any assistance themselves. No medical assistance, no government assistance. They're not, um, you know, they're not mooching off the system because they're not getting anything. They're paying their taxes, but they're actually not getting much of a benefit in, in, this, in the way that most of us do. Um, so that, that's a big challenge for people. Access to credit is a huge one. People can go to Chaddock Motors or Cars and Credit or somewhere and buy a car like in 10 minutes and they will work them, with them. But it's really hard to get a house or a mobile home and again, these mobile homes, people are paying, on average in Rochester, I'd say about 310 to 325 a month for lot rent, which covers their garbage and the privilege of being there. That's about it. They're responsible for everything above the ground or from right below the ground and up. So they take care of their house and, uh, and go from there. So if you have your house paid for, you pay 325 a couple hundred bucks for utilities, 525 a month is about as cheap as you can find um, anywhere in town. And so I hate mobile homes. Um, <laughs> I don't like crawling under and seeing the dead rabbit there, you know, and everything else and, and looking and going, why is there water here? And realize that's not water. That's the toilet flushing. It's just coming out the bottom of the house. So you see all this stuff, but it's, it's a big need that we have. And so what we try to do as a church is we try to connect with other churches, businesses, and people want to help out. And we kind of leverage that volunteer piece to save money for people to fix up their houses and, and keep them in something that's livable. The other issue that we have is uh, moisture. And with the moisture is mold. So a lot of kids, a ton of kids, and Pete could talk to this. I mean, there's so many of his public health nurses that we talk to and work with who are working with families. Kids have severe asthma and respiratory problems because of uh, the mold in these houses. It can be mitigated. It doesn't take that much to do. Um, but it does get to be a challenge if we start to do things the right way with the codes and such, trying to fix some of these old homes. So it'd be nice to uh, find ways to replace more of them and to remodel those that are uh, salvageable, I guess. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. I thought that was a real important story to get told that doesn't get told very often in our community when we talk about housing. Mr. Geeson, tell us about the impacts on the collective community health, both physical and mental. Well, Jeff, you led into this, my quote I was going to share, Jeff's, Jeff's story le is leading right into it. I'm sure all of you uh, have heard of Florence Nightingale, uh, the pioneer of nurses back in, from the 1800s. 
she quoted, and I'm looking at a former nurse there, Pat, um, and there may be other nurses, but you can appreciate this. She said, the connection between health and the dwelling of the population is one of the most important that exists. So think back uh, during the 1800s when she was uh, pioneering in nursing and uh, saw that connection between where we live. And clearly, we've advanced a lot since the 1800s in, our, in most homes and in, in where we're living. But, but it was a, a, a perfect example of what's called a social determinant of health. For us to be able to tackle issues like obesity, cancer, heart disease, you know, getting our kids immunized, they, they, we have to look further upstream to the things of where are they living, how are they getting to school and into the different activities, are they getting an education, do they have a solid uh, uh, home in which to come back to. So those are what we call social determinants of health, that if, you, if those aren't in place, it's tough to get your kids immunized, it's tough to get um, the right nutrition and physical activity and so on. And so uh, examples like Jeff's work are really foundational in order to even get to the point of really helping our kids become healthy. So um, Steve alluded to it at the very beginning. It, clearly the connection uh, in addition to those are things specifically, and Jeff's examples are, are the ones we do here every, every day really from both our environmental health folks and our nurses around mold uh, and the link to respiratory disease, um, water, sewage, things like that. The basic things many of us just take for granted are still very real issues in our community. Um, but also other things, just being able to, um, I, from a, the, the broader public health perspective, what we do is, is take an active role in monitoring the health of our community for all of us. So uh, a process that we're just going through our second cycle in is our, what's called a community health needs assessment. And we're doing, partnering that with public health Mayo Clinic and Olmsted Medical Center among a number of other community organizations. And we really go through a process to say what are our biggest challenges in the community. We have a lot going for us, but we also have some challenges. And, and soon to be released in this assessment, we'll identify uh, uh, our new top five issues. Four of the five are the same that, uh, from our last cycle. But the, the, a couple clearly linked to uh, uh, housing. One is financial stress. Back in 2013, when we did our first community health needs assessment, 26% of our population respondents in a survey that we did jointly with our other partners reported that they are stressed and paying their bills every month, 26% back in 2013. In this year, when we did the same survey, asked the same questions, it's at 29%. So not going in the right direction. So clearly knowing that housing is a major uh, part of our, our budgets, that that's a big stressor in people's lives. Another one Steve mentioned also is mental health, and, and that's another one of our top five priorities and has been and probably will continue to be very complex issues, but it touches every one of us in, our, in this room. But again, without those solid foundational aspects of our life, good housing, solid housing, uh, it's difficult to be able to stay healthy, uh, let alone get ahead, of, get, a, get ahead of the curve around our health. So a um, couple things so that, you know, we, we're the ones who try to keep track of our health as a community, but we also have those day-to-day -day work where we're uh, working on healthy, what the healthy aspects of housing and homes, uh, working on our public health nurses dealing with um, the situations that, that Jeff has been facing, but helping clients work through those situations as well. Okay, I'd like to just take just a few minutes here and, and ask some questions. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to the panel, and I'm going to ask each one of them to give us a wrap-up of what they need in terms of resources to address their aspect of the business. So, are you our mobile mic, Ann? The mobile mic is a rotate one. Okay. Can you see that? Right here. Right now in the blue shirt. I think he was first. Bob, you're so Okay. Bob's first. I knew that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Steve, you talked about do we want to be, have our workers have to travel from here to Cass and to Byron and so on. The question that raises in my mind is how can Cass and Byron, uh, Pine Island, et cetera, build affordable housing, same size probably, same quality probably, that we can't? How do they do it? Uh, the question is how, if, if people are going to be commuting to the smaller towns that surround Rochester in order to find cheaper housing, why is it cheaper? Usually associated with land prices. Well, 
No, Byron isn't very cheap. And in fact, uh, the new lots that are coming online in Pine Island are the same cost as the new lots coming online in Rochester. So certain aspects of creating that housing can be cheaper. Sometimes it's a perception. Are we going to create all the housing in Olmstead County in Rochester to serve all the people that are going to be moving in? Probably not. Are people going to want to commute and live in Elgin and Plainview and Racine and what have you? Of course. That's not my question. My question is how do they get five buildings for no housing? Just land prices? Typically it's just land prices. There can be lesser prices relative to government fees. Some of those have their shorter timeline for their processes because they have less activity and they're a smaller town and they don't charge the fees Rochester charges. So that's one of the inputs that's lesser. But usually it's land development cost. That's the, the one item that can be different. Was that good, Bob? Yeah, thank you. Sir. Uh, my name is Marty Cormack, and my question has to do with inclusionary housing. It sounded like your earlier discussion had a lot to do about the cost uh, to produce affordable housing. But how does an inclusionary zoning ordinance change that equation? Okay, the question was on inclusionary zoning ordinance. You may have read something about that recently. The city council has just, pat, has just entered into a contract with an organization, a consulting organization called uh, Grounded Solutions to educate the council as to evidence-based best practices that have been employed around the nation for inclusionary zoning. Usually inclusionary zoning requires a developer to create X percentage of workforce priced apartments for every market priced apartment that's going to be. So if you're going to build 100 departments, uh, there 20% uh, of them is a, is a common uh, mix, 80-20. Sometimes it's 15-85, uh, sometimes it's 90-10. But they're required to create, whether it's single family for sale homes or rental apartments. Now the question is, how does that get paid for? In many areas, it's just been put on the developer. Developer, you've got to find a way. And in those communities, evidence suggests it hasn't been as successful. In other communities, they found other ways to subsidize that required mixed use. That mixed use is seen to be preferable because it puts lower income people in the same neighborhoods as higher income people, whereas in many metro areas, the lower income facilities are built where the land is cheaper which tends to be land that is not as conducive to commercial development, that which is landlocked between the interstate highways and what have you. And so all of the people of lesser means are relegated to one corner of the community and not distributed around the community. So that is seen as the, the attractive aspect of mixed use kinds of ordinances. And that's what's under study right now. It's, it's a hot topic. Uh, a lot of developers don't like it, particularly if they perceive that the cost of that subsidy is going to be just loaded on them or on the other market rate renters in their facility. Uh, but that's what we're hoping to find out through Grounded Solutions, to find out if there are evidence-based best practices from around the nation that do it differently than that. Anybody want to take that and add to what I said or argue with it? Uh, no, that's, that's the, the situation. Um, in Minnesota, we don't have very good state legislation that speaks to that issue. Um, the state legislature has never been too uh, interested in, in uh, coming up with a really good law. We have a law that, that speaks to subdivision activity and the, re the ability of a community who regulates subdivisions to require uh, certain lots in a subdivision to be affordable. And uh, that's really the, the extent of the law in Minnesota. The laws that apply to the apartment houses and things like that would have to be managed under the agreement with the developer. The developer would have to agree they can't be mandated technically at an apartment level. But the developer would agree if the subsidies that they're being offered were good enough. So one of the things of the study is the, how much subsidy is necessary to make one of these projects look attractive to the private uh, construction industry. That is your question? Sir. I had an impression that the uh, state of Minnesota had a commitment to help uh, invest in the infrastructure of Olmstead County and in cooperation with the DMC project, uh, but yet I have not heard anything tonight that would include that strategy. 
uh, in the area of transportation, in the area of uh, financial resources for uh, housing, if housing or you know a workforce environment uh, in in Olmstead County is considered an infrastructure area. I don't know how this topic and the infrastructure investment strategy in conjunction with DMC uh, plays together. I have an answer for him. Would you guys like to take a shot at it first? Well, I could. And from the standpoint of the DMC, which was an economic development legislation, uh, no money has come to the community except in the form of the sales tax that was extended by the Olmsted County for their portion of the responsible transit improvements in the future, which none of the transit expenditures have been made so that sales tax that's being collected is being used for county road work. That's the infrastructure so far at the, at, at the level that we experienced so far. Affordable housing is not a major part of the, of the DMC legislation. Uh, most of the uh, city of Rochester is responsible to put forward $128 million towards the uh, DMC effort. Um, most of that is for existing infrastructure, sewer, water, streets, that kind of stuff. Uh, additional programs for housing. Um, haven't really reached the level of uh, importance yet. When they asked how much money was needed to make Rochester the attractive place that people would want to come to work at, if the Mayo Clinic agreed that they would stay here and do their expansion here, the quid pro quo was what we need to do is, is uh, basically make transit a better, that's about one of the biggest part of the infrastructure improvements is to uh, increase the transit availability and that's for all type of workers who have to get downtown. So that's a, the biggest part. There's a lot of studies being done on the transit issue right now. There'll be a newspaper article probably tomorrow. And if you watch the news tonight, uh, the town is full of, of transit uh, and transportation experts that are going around the city trying to decide how much and where these expenditures should take place in the future on traffic and transit improvements. I'll take a quick little shot at that too. Um, without being disparaging towards anybody, if you look at the uh, executive summary that you, I, you, at least you could find online uh, for DMC, there is a reference to housing expenses, but there's no clear conduit, no clear line for how any amount of money from any particular pot would get to a specific housing. There's a recognition that there is going to be, it's going to be required that there be this level of housing close to the downtown core to serve the employee growth. But it's not a clear conduit. And if you talk to the leaders, they'll tell you it's, it's, it's still yet to be determined. Now, relative to the bigger picture and raising funds in the community in general, which is essentially what I was hired to begin to do for on behalf of the foundation and on behalf of this initiative in the community. In 2000, 1999, 2000, when the foundation first took this project uh, on behalf of the community, because foundations do this kind of thing, take leadership of community issues that don't seem to have a natural home. Uh, it was in the person of Steve Thornton, who was the president at the time, Al DeBoer, and Al Tuntlin, two local entrepreneurs that arguably were at the top of their credibility and success in the community at that point in time. It was a time in our community when we had a number of startup companies. Uh, the stock market had seen many IPOs go off the charts. Lots of money was flowing. People were feeling quite successful. And they went to Mayo and they said, we want to build 875 housing units in the next five to eight years, and we need $10 million. What do you think? And they said, well, we'll give you $4 million, and then if you raise another $3 million in the community, we'll match it. And they did. So they hit the street in 2000 with $4 million and said, who wants to play with us? They didn't have a real clear plan other than we're going to create 875 housing units, but they had $4 bucks. Now it's 2016. The world is a little bit different. All those companies that were started in the late 90s are gone or have been consumed by national entities, and we don't have the, the same uh, scope that we had at that time. The medical industry is in a totally different situation relative to their disposable income and how much they think they need to put in the piggy bank for a rainy day because they can't predict the future. And so they're also saying, you know, a lot of the money that you guys spent on housing through the 2000s, creating the 1,100 units I talked about earlier, it tied up that money for like 30 years. Can't we get it back into circulation? Do you have to tie it up for 30 years? So they're telling us that they're interested in contributing, 
but they can't guarantee that they contribute to the same level they did before, but they want to play because they know they have to, but they're interested in bring us bringing to them a model that revolves the money more rapidly than 30 years. So we are working with them on that to find some definition so that we can begin a fund drive in the community, but we don't have definition to that yet. So we haven't had, other than what the county board has done, and they stuck a stake on the ground and said, we will levy a tax, and we will take the slings and arrows that go along with levying a tax. And what the city council has done in the past and what they've said they'll do in the future relative to TIF and community development block grants. Other than that, we don't have strong buy-in yet at this point, and that's what we have to develop, and that's why programs like this, so you all can understand that housing isn't about poor people and not working people, it's about working people that are making it into the mid-50s. That's the message that isn't firmly out there in the community that needs to get out there. Was that without being disparaging? Steve, you talked to, or somebody talked to, uh, DMC's impact in the future on affordable housing. Positive, negative, no impact. Well, our impact on housing is certainly going to be significant, positive or negative. But you know, we have some choices to make in our community as to uh, how much, what kind of housing we want to have. Do we want to control it? Do we want to guide it? Um, do we want to make sure that people in the service jobs that we absolutely rely on every day? Uh, and I mean, these service jobs aren't just the, the things that we don't have to have, like a latte. Those are nice too, and it's not even just changing our oil. It's the people that work at Bear Creek Services and the people that work at the detox center because for every 50,000 people that come to town, there's going to be some folks that have substance abuse issues or that work at Hiawatha Homes or that work at Seasons Hospice. These are all absolutely essential human services that form the safety net of our community, and they're not all provided by government. They're provided by nonprofits, and a lot of the people working in most of the people working in those nonprofits make the incomes. That's part of that 36 percent I talked about. So, is it going to have a, a negative impact on our community at DMC? Gosh, I don't know. Most communities would love to have this problem, but it is a challenge that we do it right. It's as far as far out of my pulpit as I want to go. Anything else? Mr. Miner, Mr. Miner wanted me to point out that the housing numbers that I provided are Rochester only, not Olmstead County, as I said. Uh, now, I will tell you that the apartment numbers were Olmstead County, but the housing numbers he gave me were Rochester. So not to misrepresent Mr. Miner. Mr. Major. Just a couple of things. Uh, when we built the first homes, they were sold for $138,000 with a $10,000 subsidy. So the buyers actually paid 128,000. That was a two-bedroom uh, split with an attached garage, or a two-bedroom split with a detached garage. Uh, Bigelow built a lot. Dewitt's built a lot. Lumber One built a lot of those homes. That same home today would be a hundred thousand dollars more, and that's that's the reality. And it's not just the cost of land, although land is one of them. And for Bob's sake, uh, you know, it's supply and demand. Not not a lot of people want to go to Casson and live, uh, even though there may be the perception is cheaper. Uh, it's just supply and demand. People want to live in Rochester because they work here, and that's where every, that's where the services are. So sometimes the things are cheaper out there, especially the used houses, because it's supply and demand. The demand is just out of sight in Rochester at this point, and um, you know that's the way it is. That's the it's part of the market. I have never seen the market so stressed for the number of houses available in Rochester, and I've been doing it 40 years. Dwayne's been doing it too. And uh, it's, never, it's never been this way. Uh, it, it's almost unbelievable. And the numbers that he gave you were correct. Uh, I think <laughs> it's hard it's, to uh, believe out of me, isn't it? For, yeah. for, on that particular day for Rochester, not for Homestead County, but for Rochester. Any other questions? Dwayne. An interesting benchmark. She has a mic for you. An, an interesting benchmark, and, and Jim can help me with this. I got into real estate in 1988. IBM was just bringing in a big load of people going into 1990. Somehow I remember that there were 700 homes for sale in Rochester at that particular occurrence. I think that's pretty close. And today we have 
in the Rochester market about? Less than 300 single family homes. We are, what, Jim, uh, 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 we are twice as big a city right now yeah. as we would have been then yeah. in population. So if you want a sense of how much stress, buying stress there is right now, just think about that, that, it, that at that time, more houses, much smaller population. And today we have far fewer houses and a much larger population. We are way beyond stress. So, the, and and I, I think that sometimes we let the argument about people can live in, and I'll just go a little bit farther, let's say Dodge Center, and we say, holy cow, you can get a really inexpensive house there, but they have to buy a new car. That car payment is the difference of their house payment. And pretty soon it almost is what it would cost them to get a loan for that house cheaper out there than what it would cost them in here in, in town. So it just doesn't work. There's, there are realities to moving out of town that are all of a sudden back in your budget. And that's, I mean, I know Steve has done some of those kinds of pushing around in his budget up here. So I, I, some of those things are just good benchmarks for us to remember that. And then I got one little piece I'm going to put here for Joe. This is a gift, Joe. You'll love me for saying it. But every time Joe comes to the community with a hearing and he says he's going to build 100, 200, 50 affordable housing units, Joe will have 50 or 60 neighbors right in that room with him just chomping at his pants that they don't want him to build the building. If we as a community want affordable housing, we have to welcome when they're going to be built. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because there are no sane people that would come tonight to listen to this if they already didn't have a heart for it. But remember to help your neighbors know that we want to have affordable housing and that when Joe comes to a hearing and wants to build something, we should all be there saying, thank you. Thanks for helping out our community. So there you go, Joe. I give you Well, now you can see why this retired cop has to rely on all these brilliant people to find out answers to these things, so I can get up and talk to you about it. Uh, lady and gentlemen, uh, start with Pete. What do you need to address your issues relative to housing? Give me one minute. Give me a one minute wrap. What do you need? I wish it was a simple answer, but I think any, with any complicated problem, it takes a, a broader community discussion and understanding to keep all of these issues going because it seems to me it's like the multiple levers um, looking at it as holistically as possible but so I don't have any one specific need per se other than continuing the conversations at a community level uh, look thinking about I always think about Jeff's the people Jeff are, is trying to help as as our benchmark to how well we do and then from there if we if we do well if Jeff does well as a pastor with his clientele I think the rest of our community will be doing well Jeff, this is your chance, buddy. What do you need? All right. I need money and I need people. No. <laughs> um, we do. We need. Where are you and how can they get a hold of you? We need a revolving fund that we can that we can use that we can build up and we can do more projects and we can get some staff. We're gonna hopefully spin off a nonprofit from our church that would house this. Um, the other thing is uh, building code stuff. Um, we do need a little more of a. Uh, I'd say a streamlined process and a, a way to interpret the codes for mobile homes that is a little simpler. People are building and fixing these houses all the time without any kind of permits. You try to get permits and you run into a lot of walls sometimes. And I'm not against building safety, but we just need to have uh, a more a clear roadmap of how to, how to fix these homes. Um, Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Jeff, more staff. Yeah, I don't think that's really... What we need is more people that come to support these projects when they are, appear at city council meetings and places like that. As pointed out by Dwayne, that if there is a, what, what you don't have is you have a one-sided hearing all the time. You have the person who's proposing the project and everybody who's against it. And I, when I talk to groups like this, I said, if this is an issue, people should show up to support these projects just as much if they want them in their community. 
um, and that would that would help. It's not that it happens all the time. I mean, projects aren't killed by every every uh, negative or NIMBY comment. We call it not in my backyard, uh, but it would help. It would get the issue out there. It would get the issue of affordable housing and how important it is to the community. If people showed up at the meetings when it was being proposed and said, hey, it's a great idea. Let's have more of it. Cheryl. I would echo all um, the previous comments. I think um, speaking with your elected officials um, about the importance of it and supporting it, showing up at uh, neighborhood meetings, uh, community meetings, public hearings, um, in support of the affordable housing development process and um, proposed developments, I think is um, hugely helpful. Mr. Weiss, the most generous well, Republican <laughs> in the community. I thank Dwayne for setting off a thought in my mind, and that is uh, uh, I, I made the comment that we couldn't do affordable housing without help from the federal, state, and local government. Well, I have to take that back and say, or quote the uh, former uh, commissioner of the Minnesota did you, did you have something you wanted to Housing Finance Agency, that? who made this statement that um, you could give me millions and millions of dollars, and I still couldn't solve the affordable housing problem because of the NIMBY syndrome. So uh, we have to throw that in there too. That, I appreciate it, Dwayne. All right. Well, I want to thank the panel. Um, I, I, oh, no, I guess that goes over. Here. I always find it uh, interesting to listen to these folks. There's always something to learn. I want to thank you for coming tonight, and I want to thank you for bringing your questions. If you have more, I'm sure the panel will stick around a few minutes if you want to come up and ask them something, or, or if you're any autograph seekers in the room, I'm sure they'll stick around and sign your program. But uh, what are we doing?